Hi there, this is Adam Ballinger and I'm responding to some topics that came up in trainings and seminars and today it's about the bow. Uh, the bow is kind of a new lingo and I think there's other terms that go with it but the reference is to the spine as it being like a bow and the muscles and tendons and ligaments and things like that is an accumulated process that make up the, the connection between the ends of the bow the connections between the end of the bow that keep it upright and curved. And this is a fabulous concept. If you've paid attention or read or studied some of Thomas Meyer's Anatomy Train's work, he presents this concept of the bow and the string or the connection between the ends of the arch that keep it arching. And if you were to bend it down farther, there is some other tensile strengths and connections through the body, it's a little bit more complex, that keep the bow trying to go both up and down. And between these different strengths and tensions and the workings of the bones, we can create this wonderful movement through the spine that has tension that creates elongation and uprightedness. This is what we call axial extension. In my book, good, strong, and mobile axial extension is basically the goal of all physical yoga practice. Bigger goals for other things when we get into centering and meditation, but for the human body, axial extension is what all the limbs lead to and what the condition of the spine should be focused on. So the bow and the string or the tension that holds that bow and gives it some of that elasticity is really, really important. Now the troubling thing is that if you work this as if your head is here and your hips are here, and there's one bow from top to bottom. That's very troubling. I'll put a little nose here. Hello. And if your legs are down here. So if you try to work it like this, as if your bow is somewhere connected down by your tailbone or your sacrum, and the other one is up by your head, this is fairly dangerous. And the reason why is your body's bow is actually made up of three or more bows. I'm gonna make it simple for today, but we could argue there's even more than three. If you try to do this with your body and you make the muscles really strong on the back and you stretch so that you can arch like this, you are going to put a ton of movement and joint structures at risk. And here's the reason. In your body, the way that your hips and your shoulders do a lot of work. And this is where we get our appendages, our arm appendages and our leg appendages. They are built on part of the construction of the arches. So if you take your low back and you arch it too deep, your hips sink back and flex so deep that you'll tend to get really tight hip flexors and probably create a lot of dysfunction in the way your legs move forward and back. Yeah, your hips and trunk are built to work at an optimal position and creating too much curve here can create dysfunction in the low back. Not to mention that the joints along the lower spine, they're called the facet joints, are the ones we're focusing on the most. In this deep of a curve, those facet joints lean on each other very intense. And it doesn't matter if you go straight back or back to the side. Those facet joints are going to take a beating. Those facet joints, if they're healthy to begin with or close to healthy, because they're like a lot of other joints in your body, it will take a while for those to deteriorate. So while you're improving the depth of your back bend, it could be something where you are increasing the wear and tear on your joints and you won't begin to notice that wear and tear until you create enough damage that it creates pain. What you might notice if you did some other types of testing and movement stuff is a loss of power and some of the loss of different areas of range of motion. 
Usually if we increase a whole bunch of range of motion in one area, it's very common to actually decrease it in another area. Okay, so on this one, if you create this one big bow, the joints are at risk and some of your muscle balance also becomes at risk. The second part is that if we arch, let's say this is about the bottom of the lumbar, if we arch very intense here, part of the string are the muscles creating the curve. When this arch curves this deep, because the top of the lumbar isn't close to being right over the bottom of the lumbar, the muscles and the joints don't work the same. So when the top of the lumbar spine goes too far forward, a lot of times the bottom of the lumbar becomes more flat. It can be flat and tipped forward and look like it's arching, but it still can very often become flat, which puts the discs at risk of bulging towards the back. It's great to be upright. If for some reason your posture was tipping forward or down, it's great to be upright. But the balance of where you do it is very important. And that's why our human body has a bow at the bottom that we'll call our lumbar, a bow in the middle that we're gonna call our thorax, and this is where our ribs are, the 12 vertebrae in the middle of the spine, and the last one is the cervical spine. And if you look at it, this bow and this bow, really cool, have really unique muscles that help each one of those bows function together. This bow doesn't have the same musculature right on the vertebrae that the lumbar and the cervical have. This bow's tension is much more complex. It relates to your core and your arms and your pectoral girdles. It's quite complex. But the unique work between all three is that if you can create the right amount of tension and mobility, then the three work together to balance. And even more cool, and this doesn't mean everything in the world, the number of vertebrae in the top and bottom bows, seven and five, equal the number of vertebrae in the middle bow. Yeah. You can look up online or find it in books. These even have generalized optimal co-working angles. And we perform different movements dominated in the most healthy way by movements in different areas. When you begin to take the different segments of the curves out, you get in big trouble. If you went for this one big arch, you would also put a lot of dysfunction in the neck and a lot of dysfunction in the arm workings as well. This might perform really good on a yoga mat, but overemphasizing the back bend motion or the back bend position takes a lot of function out of how your hips and your arms work. It's kind of cool how this all comes together. And then even further, as we can add the back of the skull and the back of the sacrum into our bows and say there are two hard curves at the top and bottom of the three middle curves. Really good human movement has a combination of flexing and bending in the different segments for different movements. And they usually counterbalance each other. So having a bow that goes forward balances a bow that goes backwards. And this also brings our ability to move our arms and our legs in very unique combinations, and then even articulate our head on top of that. Really good work on the yoga mat brings not just greater mobility to the spine, but greater conditioning for the strength of the bow. And then last but not least, and maybe even the most important, is coordination through it. A backbend dominated practice can create a lot of dysfunction, even if you don't wear out the joints. And a forward folding dominated practice, again, can create a lot of dysfunction. Balance between the two movements can help bring balance development, but that might not even bring the coordination. So at some point in your yoga practice, practicing exercises and combinations that require 
good coordination between different segments of the curves is one of the greatest tricks to longevity for your yoga practice. It's not about doing a forward fold and getting your leg behind your head or a back bend and putting your feet on top of your head, although those are very impressive to do. The greatest thing for the longevity of your spine, the axial extension, is the conditioning and coordination so that the bows or arches can work together through the strings that coordinate them. The strings, if you want to call them bow strings, thinking of Thomas Meyer's analogies, for the neck and the lumbar are pretty easy to figure out. The conditioning from the bottom of the thorax to the bottom of the cervical spine is a lot more complex and the coordination between them becomes a, even a little bit more tricky. All right, so the answer to the question about what do you do with your bow, speaking of the spine, is not that complex. Develop just enough curve on the top and bottom so that they will hold you up. You can think of the lower back as pulling the forward arching thorax up. And the forward arching thorax has just enough curve to let your arms work well. On top of that, we need a bow and strong enough muscles to bring the head up on top of the thorax. And if I coordinate these, I can really move all of my appendages well, even with a little bit of rotation. Once you have this optimal relationship for longevity, your best key is stability. Which direction should you stabilize it in? Well, in from just about every direction. All right, there's my quick lesson on what to do with your bow and things you might not have known when it comes to your spine and its arches and curves. I hope this helped. This has been Adam Ballinger.